Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Paola Corti, and I am the Open Education Community Manager at Spark Europe, uh, working with the European Network of Open Education Librarians uh, in order to implement, uh, as at best, contributing at least to implementing the UNESCO year recommendation. Uh, this is the fifth episode of our Open Education Cafe. And today's topic is action area number four of the UNESCO year recommendation, uh, nurturing the creation of sustainability models for OER. Um, our champions today are uh, in order. Ebba Ossia Nilsson, uh, ICDE board member, ICDE OER ambassador and chair, and uh, a member of the advocacy committee and uh, also vice president of the Swedish Association for Open Flexible Distance Learning. Uh, and then we have Jacques Dang, secretary of the board of directors uh, L'Université Numérique in Paris, France. And uh, uh, we have Paul Stacy, uh, who is now an independent consultant for open education efforts worldwide uh, at paulstacy.global. Uh, so we have uh, Sweden, France, and Canada represented. And thanks again, Paul, for waking up so early to join us. It's a pleasure to have you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to have all of you uh, um, around this virtual table today to uh, enjoy a coffee together and discuss about sustainability because uh, I'm sure that uh, your experience and uh, the projects that you've been involved uh, uh, so far and uh, <laughs> involved at the present time, it can be very helpful for the community of our librarians first, but uh, at large with all the participants to this uh, Open Education Cafe and all the people that are willing to look at uh, the recordings afterwards. So thanks again. So very quickly, going back to the UNESCO year recommendation, which, which is something that uh, from time to time I used to do myself because uh, uh, sometimes I remember the main title of the action areas. But then when we dive into the description of each action area, a lot of suggestions come mm, very handy <laughs> uh, and ideas about uh, what is meant with that title. So going back to it, uh, um, very briefly, I would love to um, read it loud, uh, the begin the introductory text, and then at least the five main, uh, sorry, the seven main uh, small titles for each um, area. Member states, according to their specific conditions, governing structures and constitutional provisions are recommended to support and encourage the development of comprehensive, inclusive, and integrated OER sustainability models. And then the details that follows start with reviewing current provision, procurement policies and regulations to expand and simplify the process of procuring quality goods and services to facilitate the creation, ownership, translation, adaptation, curation, sharing, archiving and preservation of OER. Then we have the second point, catalyzing sustainability models, not only through traditional funding sources, and this is very important to me, uh, but also through non-traditional reciprocity based resource mobilization. And then we have promoting and raising awareness of other value added models using OER across institutions and countries where the focus is on participation, co-creation, generating value collectively, community partnership, spurring innovation, and bringing people together for a common cause. The fourth point is enacting a regulatory framework that support the development of OER products and related services. The fifth is fostering the faithful linguistic translation of open licenses. The sixth, providing mechanisms for the implementation and application of OER, as well as encouraging the feedback from stakeholders and constant improvement of OER. And last but not least, optimizing existing education and research budgets and funds efficiently. 
So uh, it's uh, surprisingly, I would say, budget and funds come last. <laughs> it's not least, but uh, the focus uh, going back to this action area is much more on collaborati collaboration, co-creation, uh, finding ways to make value through the community efforts. And um, well, it's interesting to me uh, to go back to these bullet points and I'm um, really willing to listen to the three of you discussing uh, around this. So uh, the first question for you would be um, uh, to ask you if you could introduce yourself a little and uh, briefly tell us what you're working on at the present time, most of all in relation to this action area. And uh, women's first, so Ebba, I would leave the floor to you first. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Paula. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here to this uh, very nice uh, session, uh, Cafe Number no. 5. It's wonderful to be here together with my <clears throat> co-panelists. Uh, so I am uh, Ebba Schenelson. I'm based in Sweden, in Lund. Uh, I'm a professor in innovation in open online learning and also an independent consultant and researcher and quality uh, Reviewer, uh, as uh, Paula said in the introduction, I'm in the board for ICDE, which is the ICD, uh, which is International Council for Open and Flexible and Distance Education, and I'm also chairing the uh, ICD OER Advocacy Committee. Uh, since 2017, open education and OER is in the forefront of the work of ICD because it will, uh, it is about uh, human rights, uh, uh, lifelong learning, uh, quality education for all, and the core values which we used to say about access, the equity, equality, inclusion, and the diversity. Um, I do a lot of work for uh, UNESCO, uh, and not at least with the, the Dynamic Coalition on OER. I do a lot of work for uh, OECD. I'm currently working on um, a rather large project on um, uh, quality and tertiary education. I do a lot of work with uh, the European Commission as well. Um, actually, in Sweden, I was the one who uh, was the founder of OER uh, Meeting Place OER. Uh, where we also translated the OER recommendation because that was not done at that time. And I really will say and stress, as you were saying, Paula, that it is worth to go back to the recommendation now and then because it is really, really more or less a full ended report, I will say, and you find new things each and every time you go back to it. And it is a clear a statement and recommendations, what we really can do. So it's not just about those five areas and the headings. There are so much within it. And you really notice that when you do the translations. translations. And I believe in translations because uh, it is about to understand something in your own language, because it is about integration and knowing the, the, the context. It's very important. Um, so, uh, I did some, do some work on that, and I'm also the vice president of um, Swedish Association for Open and Flexible and Distance Education. So actually, my main work is about uh, openness and OER and related uh, areas and <clears throat> the whole ecosystem of openness. I will stress that as well, and I think we come back to that the discussions later on as well. Um, actually, for this uh, uh, fourth area, I'm not currently working on hands-on on this, but I work on policy level, how to work hands on on this. And I think we will come back to that also. But before I end, I will say that when you see the recommendation uh, to understand really the ecosystem of the recommendation is that you have to see all the five areas together because they are nurturing each other. They are influencing each other. They work together. So I'll stop by that now. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, and what about you, Jacques? Oh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm Jacques from Paris, and I work for the French Digital University. So we are very much involved on the work with the uh, UNESCO recommendation. We work with ICD. Uh, we have a working group on francophone countries with ICE. And also we're extending it to Portuguese speaking countries in Africa, which are the neighbors of uh, different countries. 
And so we have a very specific context, which is a context of a centralized countries such as France, which are where OER are more state supported, I would say, than market or technology driven. And the second thing is that uh, we have face a number of issues uh, around the lack or the definition of a national strategy. So we work at the member states level. So we are very much focused on national policies that can contribute to the uh, development and the use of OER. So uh, one last thing I would like to stress, which is important for us also, not only about finding uh, OER in French, OER in Portuguese, but also with uh, the work done by UNESCO on the, uh, the decade for indigenous languages or with the uh, Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie uh, National Languages Program is about the localization of content in national languages in Africa, which is a very much uh, uh, a source, uh, a focus, especially with the support, the growing support of artificial intelligence tools. That's about it for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And now it's your turn, Paul. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here also because you contributed to write this recommendation <laughs> collaboratively with others. So, I mean. Sure. Well, thanks so much, Paula. And yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. This is a topic, the, the sustainability models topic is one that I have had a long, a long interest in and, and have been fortunate to participate in and contribute ideas towards. So it's a, it's a privilege to be here. And it remains something that I'm still, uh, I think of myself as, as actively working on it. But maybe before I jump into what I'm doing right now, just to provide some context, um, I helped found BC Campus and, and part of my role there was uh, providing funding in support of OER. And so uh, associated with that funding, of course, is always an interest from the, the Ministry of Advanced Education here in Canada to see how to make sure that the results are sustainable over time. And then I worked for five years at Creative Commons. So I was very actively involved in the, the whole open licensing side of open education resources and just cultural works in general. Uh, and then in the last five years, I was the executive director of Open Education Global and what a privilege that was. So uh, I have lots of uh, firsthand experience with the open education space. Um, Maybe I'll say a couple of other things specifically pertaining to sustainability. Um, in, my, in my work at Creative Commons, there was a question that kept coming up, uh, which has to do with, you know, how does it make sense to openly license works and freely make them available to others in terms of financial, financially, your livelihood, your, your, uh, your operational means, if you're giving things away for free, how does that make sense? And uh, and so, uh, with a colleague, Sarah Pearson at Creative Commons, we we did a book called Made with Creative Commons, which looked at 24 case studies around the world that are openly licensing works and sharing them, not just in education but across all sectors. And then tried to analyze and unpack some of the strategies and thinking that went into their models and derive some recommendations that others could adopt for themselves. And so I often reflect back on that work, which was published in 2017, um, but it's still, I think, quite, quite relevant even today, because I would say, despite the considerable thinking about this uh, space and even the UNESCO OER recommendation, I'd suggest that there are not a lot of really sustainable models currently in play for open education resources. And it remains an area that needs some serious attention. Um, and then most recently, actually in preparation for this cafe, I, I wrote a, a blog post about sustainability models that attempts to kind of update the work I did in 2017, um, provide some new insights about how to think about it and actually portray three different examples of sustainability models that I think uh, could be worth considering. So maybe I'll just put a link to that in chat. I just did. Oh, <laughs> I just you. did, Paul, and thank you. Um, yes, uh, and thank you also for sharing uh, uh, this uh, in incredibly interesting post uh, before this uh, Open Education Cafe, because uh, I enjoyed it myself in order to go back to uh, some of the uh, documents that you shared before in uh, in the book, 
and that I didn't remember uh, in detail. So it was good for me to go back to it. And uh, I am full of questions, but I will wait a moment uh, because we somehow <laughs> can uh, start from the from the work that you are doing, all, all the three of you, and the work that you know other people are doing to implement uh, sustainable models for OER. Uh, let me ask you, um, is a sustainability at the art of uh, open education, not only as a topic, I mean, um, what do you think? Is, is it at the heart of open education in at present time? Should it be uh, more uh, a focus, uh, an explicit focus of open education in itself compared to the reality we are living now? and uh, the way resources are shared, the way that uh, we uh, work on them very often, including myself, getting caught into single projects, uh, getting caught into uh, a starting and an end date when we create something, uh, even collaboratively, but then this resource uh, stays there, somehow uh, abandoned to its own life, while somehow we should take care of it uh, better. So uh, how can we get this right? <laughs> we don't have a specific order. I mean, you can start whenever you want. Uh, uh, who is willing oh, well, to- I'll just, I'll, I'll jump in, Paolo. I mean, I just think that in general, the the process you've just described, which is, you know, with OE, OER typically being a project kind of done on the side with special purpose, one time funding and a start date and an end date. You know, the, I think the, that kind of model actually isn't very sustainable. It's, it's really just, you know, like here's some special purpose funds and uh, for a one time use. Um, and I think the assumption is that OER will be absorbed into the traditional ways in which education works and just become kind of a, you know, something extra that we do. Um, but, but in that sense, I would suggest that sustainability is not at the heart of what's currently being thought about in the way of OER. And, uh, and I think it's, um, I think it's holding the OER field back and limiting the impact of OER and, um, and uh, discouraging or unenabling maybe uh, the scaling of OER, making it a larger initiative, more central to the whole education process. And, and I'm very interested in what, what we might think about is how do we reverse that? How do we think about open education resources differently and actually embed a kind of sustainability model into the OER work that's being done right from the start? I think that's uh, really uh, fruitful to think along those lines. And that's kind of the direction that my mind's been going. Uh, if I continue, <clears throat> I will uh, totally agree, of course, with video poll, as I always used to do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I will also stress very much um, some, maybe some kind of other points. First of all, uh, if you look at the five areas uh, in the recommendation, I think maybe this is one of the most important one <clears throat> because it has an influence uh, on all the others, how we build policies, how we uh, work on capacity building, how we work with international collaboration, etc. So it really has an influence and impact at all the others. But, and by saying that, uh, this is maybe the area which there are less noise about. And that is uh, quite um, uh, strange. And also, um, I mean, we have we have lived with uh, OER since two thousand and two, when the the concept was co was coined, and that is some twenty years ago. So it must tell us something that we are not very good at sustainability, because I mean, what has changed? Uh, of course, a lot has changed. Uh, I'm not saying that, but. I mean, um, it is as exactly what you are saying as well, Paul, that, and you also, Paula, that, I mean, a lot of projects has been done you the years uh, from all over the world, 
<clears throat> in different kind of areas, and it is has been made for a special time or period, and the project is projects. And when the project is over, the money is over, the people is over, as I used to say. So all the projects has been made been uh, made up by silos, so to say, and they are not building on each other. And it, they are, have also been built on individuals' uh, enthusiasm. And uh, we all know also that uh, either people get uh, you know tired because they have been working worked so hard because they are so enthusiastic and then are, they are burned out or they are retired or they are moving or whatever. And when that's happened, the ideas are also uh, fading out. <clears throat> and uh, I think that is really exactly the, the case, what has happened with, with OER uh, to, to a large extent. And that is exactly why this uh, area is so incredibly uh, important that we ne really need to pay focus and attention to it how we can make it better. And especially the world we are living in now, where sustainability is maybe the, the only thing we have to work on. And also related to the SDGs, we need to build on sustainability for the individuals, for the planet, for a better world and for education for all, not leaving anyone behind. Um, I can maybe stop there for, for now. Thank you, Eva. Jacques. So, of course, I will agree with both uh, Eva and Paul about the fact that there isn't actually today a viable, sustainable model. And that, on the other hand, sustainability is a key and essential part of our work. Because, as Paul said, otherwise, uh, well, open education will be brought back into the traditional world, or as Eva says, people will be discouraged, move on, and all their contributions will fade away. On the other hand, I would say there's also another thing that would be helpful is that proponents of open educational resources or open education also acknowledge the fact that we live in a complex world which will not be 100% open tomorrow. So we need, as in the software world, to have coexistence between the two approaches. And that is not something that is uh, uh, aesthetically pleasing from a theoretical point of view, something which is not clean, uh, clear, clean cut. And uh, we have to acknowledge that. And we have to give a path for people to understand how we can coexist, how we can manage both open, non-open, and how it nevertheless serves the, a greater good in uh, furthering quality education for everyone. So that's uh, one thing that seems to me to be also important. Thank you. So just diving a little bit more into the practice, how can we ensure sustainability? Well, uh, I'd say that sustainability, uh, the tools for sustainability can vary according to the context. Uh, if you are in English speaking or Chinese speaking world, there's no scarcity of open educational resource or at least educational resources. Mm -hmm. Well, for Hispanic, uh, for Portuguese, for French, for national languages, it's a whole uh, other story. Uh, same thing. If you we have the five R's of uh, the licenses, but when we uh, even when we speak with uh, UNESCO representatives, they do acknowledge the fact that uh, in the midst, uh, in the middle of the Central African Republic, well, you focus on the first two. You're not at the stage where you can work on the three others. So, if we have to have sustainable models that can be adapted to the context of uh, the development context of each country or each uh, region. So that's, uh, and I think that's also a measure of openness to be open to such a diversity of context. Yeah, and I would jump in to say, um, well, I think there's several elements to sustainability, Paula. I mean, you know, there's the, there's the financial 
component of it, which is frequently the topic that dominates in any discussion around sustainability. And, and rightfully so, of course, we, we need to be able to somehow fund these initiatives from being something more than just a short-term project to something that's ongoing. And of course that requires some financial resources to employ the people to maintain and curate and steward the OER going forward in time. Um, and, and a lot of the research and literature about sustainability models really focuses in on, you know, what is the possible funding model that could be applied to these OER initiatives. And I think that that is an important consideration, but I think that too often we just jump to that without considering some of the other things and many of which I, I completely agree with Jacques need to be considered upfront, the context, mm -hmm. the progress and st the stage at which someone's at with their OER work. Um, but I also um, would suggest there's a few other things that could be included as part of the foundation for thinking about a sustainability model. And I, I mentioned these in the blog post, but maybe I'll just quickly uh, highlight them now. One is that I think we need to be um, looking at three basic components that are essential for a sustainable model to, e to e evolve. And one is that, that you ought to be publishing a high, what I call high value open education materials. Materials that really generate a value, not just for that one faculty member or that one institution, but more broadly across an entire domain or across a, a network of colleagues that share an interest in that particular topic. And the higher the value uh, of the resources, the more likely you'll be able to create a sustainable model. And of course, it's not just one resource, it's often a whole collection of resources that we're talking about. So one thing is to look at the, the value proposition associated with those resources. And the second thing is, and I think this is often very true for education, but not always true in other fields, but those resources have to have some sort of public good component. How will the public benefit from these open education resources beyond simply their use within a classroom setting, do the resources have some sort of uh, larger good that they generate, perhaps in alignment with what Eva was saying, sustainable development goals. And then thirdly, I think the other thing that has to happen around these uh, open education resources is that you need to have a large number of users and partners and collaborators and the larger the kind of human community that can be built up around the resources, the stronger the likelihood of having a very sustainable model that can emerge from it. So those are sort of three things I often think of as like key components uh, that must go into the consideration of designing an open education resources sustainability model. And, and it's worth noting, I think that there isn't just like one ideal model that we're looking for here. I think we're really talking about many different models. And so, uh, so the challenge becomes um, in the context we're in, the country we're in, the stage of development we're at, how do we devise a model that, that uh, takes into account those three variables that I suggested, along with the funding and financial commitment that's needed to sustain them. A comment in the chat from Robert Schuer. Nice to have you here, Robert. If you want to open your microphone, please go ahead. I mean, we so are not going to continue. Or what, were there questions or may I continue? Oh, yes, definitely. I just yes, wanted definitely. to read what Robert shared about uh, uh, Paul's uh, comment now. And uh, Robert says exactly, Paul, it's all about values. Connect OER to values. It can support, and for example, flexibilization or internationalization. Uh, and I completely relate to that, uh, given the work that we are trying to do in the annual specifically. Um, but please, Eba, continue. I will ask. Yes, I wanted also to continue on this path about uh, the the rounded value propositions, because I mean you can talk a bit about it over and over again, but it needs to be really. Uh, implemented by heart and by hand and by actions and uh, also about models. Uh, I'm not maybe a strong believer of models because models is nothing without people. <laughs> and we, so we need to go back to those uh, value propositions. Why is this needed? Of course, the first uh, obvious thing is about uh, tax money should, should go back to taxpayers. And as you were saying, Paul, about uh, the social and human good for the people. 
So I always uh, used to take the people's perspectives. And those gr ground uh, foundations or value propositions are success, equity, equality, integrity, integrity and collaboration, communication, and diversity and inclusion. Everything is built on, on those uh, value propositions. And not at least about human rights and social justice. Uh, I'm not a believer either of having just one model or even two models, because I think there are different kinds of models for different kinds of purposes. I will come back to that later, because with ICD, we have uh, had a European project, although it has become international, which is called Encore Plus. And I will say something about that later on. But before that, I think, uh, I mean, this is really the tricky question, how to get sustainability. And we have obviously failed, as we have worked on this for 20 years. <laughs> so there is something to do, but I, I really see uh, within the recommendation, when they redefined the definitions of OER, of Creative Commons, of uh, ICT, they also actually redefine uh, the stakeholders. And I think this is really, really important because uh, the question of OER or bottles or whatever, is not just, uh, one man's job. It is all stakeholders who need to be involved and preferable, they need to collaborate and interact and integrate and contribute and collaborate with each other. Uh, <clears throat> to, and I think that is actually one way to move forward, to really involve all the stakeholders involved, um, including, of course, the learners, of course, the, the parents, I mean, the public and all can, and also all kind of sectors, not just the educational sector, because we also know that OER is for public domain in different kinds of sectors, for a museum, for, I mean, for public good, whatever. So it is in all kinds of sectors. And sometimes I think we are too uh, focused in the, um, on the, the educational side. And I think we have to broaden the perspectives, both in the sector wise, but also um, to all the stakeholders. How can we really involve them? And again, change is made by people for the people. And that is really, really important. And I'm always trying to go back to that. How can we deal with that? I don't have the answer, of course, but uh, <laughs> but uh, each of us need to, I mean, focus on that if we believe in, in this is the way forward. And I will also say that, um, which I used to, to stress, we need also to work on all kind of levels because as it has been right now, it is again in silos. It is maybe one department, one teacher, one teacher group, uh, one research group or whatever. <clears throat> we need to work at macro level, at meso level, at micro level and nano level. And those four levels need to be integrated to make sustainability. They can't be separated because then things are falling in, in between the shares. So again, for doing this um, integration with all those four levels, we need to, to involve uh, all stakeholders. And when you are involved, uh, then you can take ownership. And when, with ownership, you hopefully <laughs> have courage enough to make some changes. And here, uh, talking about courage, I think here is also leaders, for example, who have the courage to make this change can help and support on this, because uh, to make this change need, needs uh, courage. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Eva. Jacques, please go ahead. Yes, I like very much what Paul said about social good and what Eva said about involving uh, uh, all stakeholders. I would just like to give an illustration. In France, it's very difficult for universities to get additional funding based on purely social good discourse. We do that all the time. Social good is very important in France, but we talk so much about it that it isn't a justification for additional funding. On the other hand, when we talked about uh, OER in, uh, in an African country, we can we have examples of synergies of a synergy between national public policy. If you have in a village or in a region a remote campus, it means a number of things in terms of national policy. It means that you won't have all the population in the capital city. 
So you will be reducing the territorial factors. It also means that you can have, in addition to access to uh, the remote campus, to the Moodle service and the uh, open education resources, you can have basic uh, health healthcare tests about diabetes, about obesity, which contribute also to uh, the social good. And you can also have a small scale local economic development uh, uh, benefit. So synergies, social goods can be actually uh, achieved if we can take them on a very practical level. It was just an illustration of something I didn't invent, but I've seen work in uh, some African countries and which is we're not managing to do in France, actually. Thank you, Jacques. About the practical level and uh, connecting it to the high value of OER, you underlined the poll. I have a question. Uh, what do you mean with high value? I mean, is high value a resource that is uh, uh, takes into account uh, enabling others to adapt it as easily as possible? Is it part of the high value inside the no um giving room for uh, an explanation, a shared explanation about uh, the process through which it was developed in order to help others replicate the process in itself? Because otherwise, if we don't agree on the meaning of high value, that's, you know, uh, we might think uh, um, of a, a certain, um, feature of the OER and leave out the rest. And uh, mm -hmm. since uh, you all know me and uh, Jacques just mentioned uh, the practical side of the work, uh, something that came to, mm, very often uh, into the discussion that we had in, uh, in the annual around the, the creation of new outputs was exactly about that. How can we uh, enable others? So how can we? How should we design the, the OER we want to create and share in order to take this as our first goal? Not only the content, the beauty in uh, how we share it, but the tools that we use and the format and uh, the process itself. So again, which is the definition if there is one of a high value Oh, well, I, I mean, I think that that's not a simple answer, Paola. I mean, I think the kinds of attributes about OER that you're referencing are definitely inherently of value, like the ability to adapt and translate and customize and modify and update and so on. Those things add significant value to education resources that go well beyond what we typically have available. And, and I, I completely agree that, that that is an inherent part of open education and ought to be baked right into any kind of sustainability model. But, but I also think that value can have, it can be financial value. It, you know, we often talk about, we need more, we need additional money to do OER, but I actually think that it's quite feasible to do OER within the existing financial model of education. It just requires a different utilization of those funds. And, and I think that there's an easy argument to be made that OER is of higher value to education overall than, than the utilization of funds in, in a, often the way that we typically make use of those funds. So, and it may very well end up be that open education is like more cost effective if you wanna just look at the, the value of the financial utilization of funds. Um, but I also think that there's a different kind of value that we, we sometimes uh, don't talk about. and so. Um, maybe I'll just mention a couple of points related to these different ways we can think about value. One has to do with like the people side that Eva keeps mentioning, and I completely agree with the importance of this people dimension to the sustainability model. And so I really feel like when we talk about open education resources, we're talking about collaboration, not competition. So. Our whole systems tend to be set up to support competition, including the way we reward people and the way we, we incentivize people in terms of promotion. Um, but if we really want to have a sustainable model around open education resources, we need to think about how do we build collaborative teams of people 
that will work on not only the finding of OER and creation of OER, but their stewardship and kind of guardianship going forward over time. That's a really, really critical, important piece from my perspective. And, and we often don't bake into these models the practice of openness, right? It's not just about collaboration, it's about sharing, it's about making use of uh, each other's work. And I think those kinds of considerations add a different kind of value, a kind of human dimension to the value, and a, a kind of like many hands make light work kind of aspect to the model that I think has a lot of merit. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> you mentioned one very important issue, and I also used to talk about and, and highlight that myself. There are actually some more R's, and one of them is about recognition, uh, I will argue, and um, uh, several others with me. But, um, and that is about, um, it can be part in sustainable, sustainable uh, the, uh, models, because if people are recognized for the work they are doing, and the work they are, um, both the work they're doing themselves, but also the work they're doing using OER and the whole open open educational uh, ecosystem. If people got recognized for that, uh, I'm quite sure it will be more sustainable uh, models because today, the, at least in the educational system and the academic system, it is about publishing in uh, you know journals and to have a different kind of research um, topics or different kind of, um, I mean, it is quite old fashioned system. And if we make, can, if it can be possible to make this change, how academics get recognized, if this is a, a high value priority, I am quite sure that at least uh, some things will change. Then another, uh, the other R, which I would maybe like to mention then, as, if I may, is about recontextualization. And that is also so important. And not at least uh, because uh, the most uh, resources which are available nowadays is in English. And uh, for many of us, uh, where English is not a native language, it is very, very important with its uh, contextualizations. And that uh, should be easy. And that is also some kind, sometimes a barrier for example, for um, I heard I heard it quite often as uh, Swedish is a less used language, and uh, it is easier for them for teachers, for example, to do it themselves. So that means that they have to reinvent the wheel instead of maybe translate it, maybe adapt it, maybe contextualize it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's easier, quicker to do it myself. Yeah, so that's why we need to design our OER better in advance. Yeah, but again, that goes back to, to the value propositions about we talked about in the beginning about uh, which I think all of us has stressed about uh, uh, the the common good and the social good and the human perspectives, the um, um, the value propositions which are in the in the SDG four about the inclusiveness, uh, uh, quality, uh, accessibility, equity. Uh, integrity, inclusiveness, diversity, etc. So everything goes back to those value propositions. We have a question from Ellen Moore for Paul. Uh, I do agree that sometimes it's about repurposing existing funds, uh, like diverting uh, funds away from pay well content to open initiatives. I think people are more willing to do that now. <laughs> I hope so, Helen. I think I think this is a practice. Uh, well, I will maybe say this. I, I think that um, open education resources and their sustainability require different practices than the way we have traditionally done education. And so this is where I think uh, the challenge starts to really happen is that if we're talking about changing at the you know, the basic implementation level of what are people doing on a day-to-day -day basis, really for OER to be sustainability in the, uh, to, to be sustainable in the long term, we actually have to change those practices at that kind of working level. And so in some sense, open education resources represent a systemic change to education. And, and because they represent a systemic change in terms of optimizing sustainability, that I think is where we run into significant barriers because education, as we all know, I think is like really hard to change. 
And despite all the push for innovation and transformation in, edu in education, it's actually very resistant to those kinds of things. And, and because of that, we often end up with models that were designed for some other purpose being used for OER. And, and that begins to be very much a limitation on the use of OER and its impact. And so I think um, the notion of reutilizing funds for something different, I completely agree with Helen. It becomes a matter of then designing what is the different process? What is the different practice that we're looking to create? And how can we shift the way the institution currently operates away from that practice to this new and different practice. And that, that is a kind of change management process that can be very difficult. And, and um, I sometimes think, oh, wouldn't it be great if you just started a new institution from scratch, you know, without any of the baggage of the existing processes and just kind of uh, made use of open education and its practices right from the very beginning. I think that would be much easier than sometimes changing the system from within. I have another question starting from these for the three of you and I would ask I would love to hear from Jack first uh, who should be responsible uh, for sustaining what in the open education ecosystem because we've been uh, talking about the long term somehow now uh, this long term change that uh, it's a systemic change but uh, what about the short and the medium term and who is responsible for sustaining what? <laughs> You're responsible, Paula. It's all up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's part of the context. Uh, the French high education system would be considered by uh, US universities as a Sovietized system. We have a national promotional system and America, the US, do not have a higher education department. They have a department of education, but not one of higher education. So things you can do vary depending on the context. But more radically, I would say that possibly in the future, I might not need to go to higher education institution. I would use just uh, uh, artificial intelligence to have my own specialized course according to what I feel I need, to what curricula I would design. So I think it's also a challenge for higher education institutions because uh, as a teachers, today I can generate a course, a Moodle course on uh, SQL databases in about five minutes with quizzes, with uh, references, with uh, content. So, do I really need to go to the mediation of a higher education institution? I personally feel we do need that, but I'm not sure everyone, every learner will feel that. It's very convenient. So uh, I'm afraid the question might be uh, not who is responsible, but who will do it and uh, how we uh, as uh, old fashioned institutions will survive in that world. Wow. <laughs> You're being very provocative now, Shock. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. I like that. And um, if, first of all, let me tell the audience that if you have questions, you're welcome to open your microphone and ask them or write them in the chat. I have one last question myself uh, that relates to the commercialization of open because I would like to know what you think about it in terms of sustainability. Can you please uh, repeat it? I couldn't follow you really. Yeah, no, the question is, uh, what do you think about the commercialization of open educational resources? Like reusing the open educational resources for commercial purposes when it, this is consistent with the, the licenses. Is this something that uh, is in the big open ecosystem picture, uh, providing an opportunity for some who don't have uh, 
an opportunity themselves or is it uh, uh, um, something that uh, you see as not helpful uh, for the um, for the open education uh, ecosystem to develop sustainably? I can jump in on this. <laughs> this is actually a tricky question, uh, yeah. especially you throw out at the end. Um, but I, I would just say, like, if we think about the the licenses in particular that are used for open, they tend to to allow commercial use. So. Um, because that's true, then if there is commercial use, I, I sometimes find it interesting that that the that many of us in open education go, ah, no, not commercial use. And but on the other hand, it, just because the license allows it, doesn't mean that it's actually good for the open education field for that to happen. And so I think personally, I think it's possible for there to be. Uh, use of open education uh, that, in, that is a, that what we would call commercial, um, where the, the provider is actually still an active participant in the open education space and is contributing back to open education and helping it be sustained over time. I think that's actually possible. It's not a common practice, but I think it's possible. And uh, and yet, of course, we know that really, in a sense, open education is a practice of commoning, what we might call the commons from the past. And that's kind of a part of how open education works. And so if open education is appropriated for commercial use and kind of exploited without contribution back to the community, I think that is where we start to have the conflict between the two fields. If we look at open source software, you know, that's a, a similar practice of openness has happened in the software world and it's enabled and allowed for commercial use at the same time as still sustaining the, the success of open, open source software going forward in time. But, you know, you look at what's happening right now in, uh, in AI and I think that this is sort of like the way artificial intelligence has sucked up all of the data from the web, essentially open licensed data and copyrighted data to train its models. You know, you could say, is that a good idea? Is that sustainable over time? Because essentially, you know, all of those works have been exploited for the creation now of a new uh, industry sector that will very much be about profit making. And so you could feel like that's not okay, what just happened there. <laughs> Um, but on the other hand, um, if you examine it from the law perspective, it very well might be okay um, in terms of text and data mining or fair use and fair dealing kinds of laws that, that pertain to that kind of practice. So, so I think sometimes there's what the law says and, and then what would be optimal or beneficial for the field overall and its long-term sustainability. Those aren't always, always the same. And I think we sometimes need to have some let's call them norms uh, rather than laws that, that define what works best for the sustainability of the field. And then this links back to the policy making, I think, and even if it's not norms or laws, we can start with guidelines maybe, and then develop them further. So thank you. Uh, I, think, um, I think what you touched upon, Paul, and um, it's not maybe not uh, my comment is not maybe related to the commercial models or not, but uh, when you, you touched about AI, and I think uh, this is really, really, uh, as I know you, yourself has written a very good blog post about that as well. Uh, and I think, uh, um, I mean, the whole discussion we have had uh, this hour about sustainable um, models and uh, should it, is it possible or is it not? I think we have to be very open-minded ourselves because there are coming new things all the time, which we have to uh, face, we have to adopt, we have to be flexible, we have to uh, see what's, uh, what does it really mean and uh, how is it related to the value propositions we, are, we believe in about education for all, not leaving anyone behind. And I think uh, with a new area of AI, there will be, maybe be many, many different kind of ways on how to look at the sustainable uh, models, if that is possible, because sustainability is good, but also sustainability need to be flexible and changing to the, the circumstances and the context. Uh, so it, it need to be balanced. 
Uh, and also we have to remember not uh, one size fits all either so but there will there will for sure uh, be a use uh, exploration with with ai and uh, you have done a very good blog post as i just mentioned and uh, we are many who are um, looking at this for the moment um, me and my uh, ambassadors from the OER advocacy committee we will have a workshop on this on that uh, icd conference in november in costa rica for example so in case you are there, you're more than welcome to, to join. I see we have actually one of the ambassadors here, Xi and Yang from China, uh, who also will be in Costa Rica with us. But I mean, we are we are many in this field who are really looking at, in the AI area and what that, does that mean? Um, for the both for the, the OER recommendation as such, but not at least for this area, this uh, area. Thank you, Ebba. Just to be mindful of time, uh, we should be over by now, but uh, we have a question from uh, Mira Bauschzuk. Uh, hi, Mira. And the question is, what about community-driven OER projects? How can we ensure their sustainability and the sustainability of their results, given that the project format usually implies temporary nature? We touched a little uh, this subject before during this call, but uh, if you want to add something about uh, ensuring the sustainability in time. Well, I can add something. I hope it's for you. Okay. Uh, I have added the uh, answer to Mia to Mira. Uh, we have uh, we have done such a project which is sustain which seems sustaining now for uh, after the project for several years now. Uh, community driven, uh, a really active community, uh, uh, managing the collection of OERs, etc. Uh, not paid by government, but paid by the institutions. The, the, the uh, collaboration of institutions, in this case for nursing in the Netherlands. So uh, we, we have uh, described some lessons we have learned yeah, that could be of use, but it, it is a, uh, we, we, we discovered two main uh, main uh, uh, things there. First was uh, the, the, the use of a quality model for OER that was really important for the for, for the decision makers to uh, to to decide to continue this project and uh, for uh, and paying for it for themselves instead of paid by the government because they really saw the value in here again value uh, for the institutions and the um, professionalization of their of their staff. Thank you, Robert. Uh, is this the project that uh, was presented uh, last year in Nantes? Yeah, we are very of... proud of this project. <laughs> yes, yes. And I remember the presentation and the project. And uh, yes, it's amazing, it's an amazing yeah. initiative. Fantastic. Yes, definitely. So our time is up and, and I'm extremely grateful to all of you uh, as uh, guests and also to our participants uh, uh, in the room uh, for this discussion. We need to continue uh, talking about sustainability and we need to provide the practitioners with uh, uh, suggestions and uh, um, guidelines when possible. Uh, so that they can at least take uh, sustainability into account while developing new OER. And maybe we can ignite some good uh, practices of uh, uh, better reuse, if possible, in order to sustain bottom-up and then work on the continue working on the policies to sustain top-down, <laughs> because we need both, as usual. <laughs> Thanks again for being uh, great people in the open education community. Thanks again. Thank you so much, each of you. Thank you, Paula. Thank, Thank you, Paula. Bye.